Hello and welcome to this edition of Roundtable. Elon Musk's messy $44 billion takeover of Twitter led many of his critics to seek out different social media platforms to share their views. And the main beneficiary appears to be something called Mastodon, which some have called the fastest growing social network in history. This new microblogging site is especially popular among left-wing and liberal Twitter users who are worried about Musk's proposed changes in the name of freedom of speech. Mastodon has now surpassed 1 million daily active users, but can it really take on the might of Twitter, which is at least 250 times bigger? Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. Well, Elon Musk polarised what many call the, the Twitterati when he promised to use Twitter's coveted blue tick to divide up its users between the peasants, as he called them, and the lords, as well as letting Donald Trump and other controversial characters back onto the platform. Mastodon seems to offer a new home to disaffected users. However, other platforms have tried to take over from Twitter before with little real success and already some are saying the new site is just too complex. So can Mastodon make a serious breakthrough? And how did social media platforms become so politically partisan? We're going to go first of all to China, to Guangzhou and there we say hello to Gareth Tyson, computer science researcher at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Down to Wales in the UK, Cardiff to be precise. Karen Wal Jorgensen is there, professor at Cardiff School of Journalism, Media and Culture, and in London, Glyn Moody, journalist and author of Walled Culture. Um, Gareth, I'll come to you when we're talking about what research you've been doing into Mastodon. But Karen, on the, on the social level, I've heard it described as a liberal, open minded, friendly place, whereas Twitter is bandwidth for bullies. Is that a fair description? Uh, well, I think that there has been growing attention on the sort of quite toxic atmosphere on Twitter. And that's some, something that we've seen over the past few years, but it's obviously accelerated really dramatically with Elon Musk's takeover of the platform. And so I think that um, a significant number of Twitter users will have been looking around for slightly more hospitable and friendly and thoughtful platforms particularly since Musk took over. And that, I think, is one reason why we're seeing this sort of mass movement to Mastodon, which obviously has already been in existence for quite a significant period of time, but has really gained very significant visibility and also a very significant number of users um, ever since uh, Elon Musk took over Twitter and started to kind of really dismantle the platform and everything that was, that's been useful yeah. about it to so many people who have been using it for years and years. Karen's suggesting there, Glyn, that it's, it's, it's a friendlier place. People don't necessarily shout at one another as much. But, of course, you can be as polite as you like on Twitter. It's the kind of reception you get. Is that what's putting people off, perhaps? Well, uh, Twitter has grown up in a certain way and Mastodon has grown up in its own way. And what's interesting is that the people who put together Mastodon have consciously tried to avoid some of the pitfalls of Twitter. So you mentioned, for example, that you can't do the kind of quote tweets which are so popular on Twitter. And the reason for that is that when you do the quote tweet, then you tend to kind of pile in on the person that, that you're quoting, that you sort of make a witty comment or even worse, you make some snarky comment. And so the idea is to have a kind of more civilised conversation with someone rather than just piling on and showing how clever you are. So it's a debating society, if you like, rather than playground bullying. Yeah, very much so. And indeed, uh, a lot of the people I've seen uh, move across in the last few weeks, who I've actually been there for nearly four years now, so it's, it's interesting to see all the people come in. They have all, practically without exception, remarked how pleasant it is because there is this presumption of respect and the presumption that 
you will actually make a sensible comment rather than just firing off whatever comes into your brain at that particular time. OK, so it sounds uh, a little bit, uh, Gareth, like it's when you're opening a door and somebody says, no, after you, and you say, no, after you, no, no, after you, no, after you, and it goes on and on forever. Um, overly polite. How does it work? Can I help you with my understanding of it, which you will tell me is completely wrong? That is that it's got lots of different servers. You then choose which one you go on and then you decide what kind of social media you're going to filter through that? Am I right or wrong? So that's actually a pretty nice summary of it. So to the uninitiated, Mastodon probably looks a little bit like Twitter. It's a microblogging service that allows people to make posts and their followers can then see their posts. But the big difference is that within Twitter, it's owned and operated by a single entity and that single entity can decide whichever policies they wish to impose there. In contrast, Mastodon, as you described, is federated. So you have many different servers operated by many different people. And you as an individual can choose which one you join. And the beauty of that model is that if you happen to join one which later turns out to be undesirable, perhaps due to hate speech or unpleasant behavior, you're perfectly free to leave and move yourself to another server which is more attractive to you. So would we be wrong in describing it as, as a single entity then? It's, it's an awful lot of different bits and pieces of the same social media fabric that happen to have congregated together because they're like-minded. Is that reasonable? Uh, exactly. It's what's referred to as a federated system where you have many independent entities owning and operating the infrastructure, but you build it in such a way that all those entities can talk to each other in a standardised fashion. So what that means is if you join one server, that server speaks the same language as every other one, which means that you can still, whichever server you join, interact with everybody else in the overall system. And you can get more letters on it, can't you? <laughs> you can, yes. So you can, you can say more, or in fact probably be saying more, by shouting less. Um, that's fantastic. Karen, is it going to take over from Twitter? What we, let's have a look at some figures. Um, Mastodon peaked at 1.6 million users in 2018. Uh, that was two years after its launch, back to... 400,000, 2022, but then, then after Mr. Musk took over Twitter, uh, the user went back over the million mark, uh, which is still a tiny fraction of Twitter's almost, with some it's between 250, depending whether you're talking about daily use or monthly use, 250 million and 300 million. What is it about what Elon Musk has done at Twitter that has upset people? Because he's basically just simply trying to rationalize a business, isn't he? Well, so part of what he's doing is that he's sort of desperately scrabbling around for ways of making money out of this flat platform. And so the um, one, of, one of the challenging things that he's done there is to, to start to charge. Uh, well, initially, his idea was to charge $20, but subsequently he scaled it down to $8 for the uh, verified status um, and then abandoning that status altogether. Um, at least that's what it looked like he was going to do for a while. And so um, that has actually, um, at least in the short term, done away with the verification um, of particular users. So you don't necessarily know whether someone is, you know, actually speaking as Elon Musk or is just impersonating Elon Musk. So this is one of the things that he's done, is that he's, he's kind of... Um, um, inadvertently creating question mark about the authenticity of particular actors on this platform. But he, um, he's let back in. Is, is it this that's upset people? He's let back in uh, figures such as Kanye West, Andrew Tate, uh, Donald Trump. Um, he's turned away Alex Scott. Is it the fact that he's basically saying, my, my game, my rules? Yes, yeah, so basically he is imposing his own kind of autocratic vision of what Twitter should be. Be, um, on this platform, which has um, existed for such a long time and such a kind of uh, useful space uh, for a lot of its, its users. And I think that in particular, the decision to allow Donald Trump back in is something mm. that um, has really upset a lot of users who are very concerned about... Well, uh, well let's Trump's be fair, he, he did have a vote about it, didn't he? And, and a majority of people who voted, I guess it was on, on Twitter, said let him back in. It wasn't like he's defying a majority. Well, he, he made a suggestion initially that any such, um, any such decision to allow Donald Trump back in would only be made after careful consultation with his content moderation board. Subsequently, he put it out to 
a boat and we assured users that actually this boat um, you know, was not really interfered with too much by bots or other questionable actors. Um, but I think that in the minds of a lot of Twitter users, there are questions around whether such a vote is legitimate and also um, whether we shouldn't be guided by the kind of legal principles that underpin platform regulation. So uh, principles around regulating uh, hate speech, uh, principles around um, ensuring that uh, you have a truthful content as much as possible on the platform. So um, in other words, he, he's making this kind of populist gesture of putting this major decision out for vote. But I think what he's really doing is to say, I'm going to impose my particular vision of what this platform should be uh, on all of the users. And that has had uh, very devastating consequences. Yeah. In well, I would have to say, uh, you started off by saying this was his way of trying to make money out of this business. Well, he's bought the business, presumably not because he wants everybody to have as much free speech as they like, but because it's a business and he wants to make money out of it. Um, Glyn, let me come to you. One of the things I noticed was that you cannot retweet. Okay, tweet is from Twitter. I understand that. Toot used to be the one that was used with Mastodon. I understand it's not used anymore. But you can't mm. retoot if you like. In other words, it can't go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 exponentially and become absolutely massive. Surely that is the whole point of Twitter. And if Mastodon doesn't have that, Who's it for other than the conversation between two people? Yeah, I think that's a good way of framing it. And I think what's happened over the last few weeks has actually focused a lot of people's attention on what Twitter really is. And Twitter is actually a broadcast medium. I mean, if you think about it, there are people with millions of followers on Twitter. There is no way that the people can interact with their millions of followers. They're broadcasting to them. Macedon is about conversations. It's about maintaining that personal element. And that's why I think it's going to be uh, interesting to see them grow because they, they both have a role. You know, that broadcast role certainly has a role. And I think Macedon's conversational uh, dynamic is also very important. And so I think that they're, they are going to diverge in many ways, that people who want a more thoughtful conversation will, in fact, move to Macedon. People who just want to listen to, you know, that they're famous football stars or pop stars or politicians will just stick on uh, Twitter and just listen to what they have to say without interacting with them. So they're very, very different already, I think. Is it possible that um, what we're seeing with Mastodon is, is Facebook, if you like, without pictures? It's basically somebody saying, this is what I think. I'm going to put this up there. Comment if you like. But it doesn't become then a big, big barney. It's not a huge argument. I don't really think Facebook is the best, you know, comparison to make. Give me Facebook... another one then, because I only just thought of that, and I thought perhaps it's going to be hopeless, <laughs> but it'll stimulate a conversation. So it's yeah, it's much more like you know a room full of like-minded people who want to have a genuine conversation rather than somebody going to a football stadium to listen to um, you know a speech given by somebody famous. So it's a matter of that equality okay. of interaction. How, how's it and going to be successful? Aspect, which, which... How, how's it going to be successful then? Because a room full of like-minded people are going to bore each other senseless after about an hour. <laughs> well, I think they've got to be like-minded, interesting people. And so arguably, you know, Macedon is just going to be full of interesting people and Twitter is going to be full of, you know, loud people. But there's another aspect I think that is worth um, emphasising for Macedon is that it is only part of something much bigger, which is called the Fediverse. So in the way that Gareth uh, explained that you can actually have communications between different parts of Macedon, Similarly, you can have communications between different parts of the Fediverse, and in particular, that means you can actually have other services. So, for example, there is already a version of YouTube in the Fediverse. There is a, a version of Instagram in the Fediverse. And the great thing is you don't need to join those services. By being on Mastodon, you automatically have access. And so, potentially, Fediverse could be actually a much bigger thing. OK, I'm sure you could continue with, with that theme. Glenn, but I'm going to go to Gareth on this one just because we haven't heard from him for a while. Picking yes. up on what we've just heard um, from Glenn, what could you find out there? Um, if, you, if you were just sort of just having a quiet, relaxing day and you decided to go <clears throat> on to Mastodon, what would you find other than somebody saying that they like Mozart? A reasonable conversation or that, you know, they, they had a very nice walk in the park today. All very reasonable yet again. What would you find out there that was, um, well, 
first of all, what would you find out and would any of it be edgy? Hmm. Well, it really depends on which instance or which server you choose to join, because as you mentioned previously, when you join Mastodon, you have to first select which server you join. And, and do you know where um, that server is going to take you, by the way, because I've never done this. Do you know, is it, is it going to say, like my Skybox or something, it's going to say comedy, drama, thrillers, whatever, um, reasonable conversation. What, how do you know which server to join? Ah, well, this is one of the challenges that people first face when trying to join these types of services. There are actually uh, websites like Join Mastodon, which give you a very nice index of many instances. And within each one, it gives you some information about what type of activity tends to go on there. Now, some of them are actually quite general. So what's sometimes referred to as a flagship server, mastodon.social, is a relatively general interest server. And if you join one like that, you'll find all sorts of different conversations ranging from football to cats. And at the moment, what you'll actually find is quite a lot of discourse surrounding the topic that we're discussing at the moment, in fact. Now, for people who are a little bit more experienced, sometimes they choose to join a more targeted server. And these servers really cover a wide, wide range of topics. Um, for example, there was ones dedicated to journalists, to academics like myself, uh, to people interested in information technology and, and so on. But as I mentioned before, one of the nice things about Mastodon is when you join one of these individual servers, it gives you wide access to the rest of the Fediverse, so you can still access content being produced on other topics on other servers. You say it's federated rather than regulated. In other words, there are no particular rules. It's up to people within uh, the Mastodonverse, whatever you want to call it, to decide what is right and what is wrong. Is there a potential here? Um, Gareth, you answer me this one first of all, and then, Karen, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Is there a potential here for a dark side to this, if you like, a, a dark web, um, a perversion of the best motives in the first place, that it could actually become something that is, is, is rather unpleasant, or elements of it could, if, if it's all on different servers? Yes, absolutely. And this has actually happened in the past, where people who perhaps don't entirely align with the original vision for Mastodon reuse the software to build services which are precisely as you describe it. Now, this was already foreseen within the people who developed the software. So they already built in techniques to deal with this. An obvious way is that each administrator of a server has the discretion to block other ones. And we've done quite a bit of research on this. And actually what you find is when some of the servers that behave in the way that you described emerge, many of the other more mainstream servers quickly block them, which means that the posts that they generate cannot pass across the Fediverse. And this has turned out to be actually quite an effective way of dealing with the types of problems that you describe. OK, so, so that's one way of dealing with it. But um, as it multiplies and as you just get these federators as opposed to millions of moderators, a handful of federators out there, it's going to be impossible to spot the nasty stuff, isn't it? Well, it's certainly an open challenge. And there's quite a lot of research going on precisely in this space. At the moment, quite a lot of moderation happens manually. So that means people look at the posts and have to decide themselves whether or not it should be allowed or not. Now, many of these uh, servers try to recruit additional moderators who can help with activity. And I think what we're seeing at the moment is probably a um, period of growing pains where we are getting some examples of content not being properly moderated. But I think after a relatively short period, once things have settled, um, many of the common standards that you'd expect on something like Twitter will be almost universally applied across most of yeah, the Yeah, and, and I don't know whether and everybody indeed, likes those because the economies of scale, when multiplied up in the opposite direction, can tend to be a, a distraction. Karen, I want to ask you your thoughts on that. What are the downsides of something like Mastodon? Uh, and then whether Twitter can survive. And if it can't, would it be because of something like this or because of something else that is brought on itself? Sorry, too much all, all at once. What do you think about what you've just heard from Gareth? Well, so, I mean, I think like any other platform, um, it will experience a lot of growing pains and you do see that at the moment. Um, I think uh, the question in the sort of longer term is who is actually going to uh, be staying on Mastodon to sustain that community? Who is going to stay on Twitter um, to ensure that uh, that Twitter actually still has users? And I think with respect to uh, the future of Twitter, a lot of people on there have adopted this kind of wait and see policy just to see what other crazy tricks uh, Elon Musk might have up his sleeve and to just, just kind of await um, 
you know, uh, what actually happens down the line because people have invested so much time and so much effort and their identities are so closely linked to Twitter. With Mastodon, I think that we are seeing significant migrations, particularly of academics um, and people who are interested in things like policy and NGOs. So there are specific populations for whom the, the sort of sensible nature of discussion on Mastodon is really very appealing. And so I think they've already become quite integrated within that community. So I think we might be seeing some diversification of the user population across these different platforms. Um, I don't think everyone from Twitter is going to move uh, to Mastodon, but I think that Mastodon has shown its relevance as a platform. Extraordinary. Let's um, take a step back here then and say, what was it, you, you first, Karen, on this one, that made Twitter so appealing, so successful, that perhaps eventually led to its, it's not its demise, I'm going to say we're way, way off that, but that led to its... Um, yellowing, if you like, in some people's imagination, the jaundicing of Twitter. What made it successful to start and what perhaps uh, didn't in the end? Well, I think what has made it so successful that it is a sort of genuine arena within the public sphere and society for um, different people from all different backgrounds to be able to express their views, uh, to share their ideas and share their projects. Um, what has happened over time is that it turns out that when you have kind of ultimate free speech, then you also have people who do bad things with the spe free speech. Okay, we're talking, Glenn, about between 250 and 300 million users every day or through the course of a month, depending on what you believe. Um, massive, 300 times more than Mastodon has at the moment. Yep. But if... Uh, Somebody in charge of Mastodon, and I don't know how commercial an operation it is at the moment, but if somebody sort of pulling all this together were to take a look at Twitter and say, we need to be successful, therefore we need to avoid doing this, what would it be? Well, just to clarify, Mastodon isn't a commercial operation in any way. It runs on free software written by people who just love writing software. And uh, all of the instances, I think I'm correct in saying, are actually... Um, run by people out of uh, love for the, you know, using their own money or increasingly because of donations. I, for example, give a donation to Mastodon.social, which is the one that I use. So there's no question at the moment of Mastodon trying to take over Twitter uh, because it's just not aligned in that. And, and would that be a so mistake if it tried to go commercial? Uh, I think there could be a place for commercial elements of um, Mastodon and indeed the Fediverse, but there's no question of the commercial world taking it over because uh, that's just contrary to the way the whole thing is operated in terms of the independent instances. Um, so uh, I, I think it's a mistake to look at it in those terms, really. And, and that and really, Twitter is the exact opposite. I mean, now it's becoming more and more driven by commercial imperatives, which I think are going to be very dangerous because there are three big problems for Elon Musk in terms of sustaining Twitter. There are governments that don't like what he's doing. There are advertisers which hate what he's doing. And then there are the app stores. Apple and Google have rules about the kind of things you can actually put on their app stores. Gareth, the picture painted by Glyn there is rather apocalyptic if you happen to be in charge of Twitter. The advertisers don't like it. Governments don't like it. it, it it's melting in front of our, our very eyes. Are platforms like Mastodon and others that are out there as well, ready to replace what we've seen with Twitter? Yeah, well, I, I think it's much more likely in the short to medium term that these platforms like Mastodon serve to supplement Twitter. We've been actually monitoring some of the migrations that have been happening of users from Twitter to Mastodon. And what we've seen primarily is people retaining and using both accounts. So what I foresee is that both will continue to operate, but in parallel but just as Glyn described, potentially for slightly different use cases. Karen, I want to ask you this one quickly. We're coming towards the end. Um, we're both journalists. Is this conversation between the four of us and the interaction of our viewers, if they send us in any messages, is that likely to be the sort of thing that appears on Mastodon? And if it's out there, tell us how we can find it. <laughs> Yeah, so I think what, what I've experienced in Mastodon, and um, so unlike the other two panelists, uh, I'm a bit of a, a newbie on Mastodon, and I have only been around for a few weeks. And I think what, what we are seeing on the platform is more considered um, content. Um, and I think that having longer posts also allows you 
to be that bit more detailed in terms of what you put put on the platform. But I think that more importantly, there's the ethos of actually having quite a positive and constructive tone of conversation, um, which is, I think, really essential to the kind of conversation that you see on there. Um, you also have much stricter rules around what kind of content you can post on there, um, much stricter regulation um, of um, certainly the vast majority of these services. And so, yes, I think you are seeing more uh, thoughtful content, but again, you also see a relatively small group of users of Mastodon um, who, you know, uh, like your other panelists have alluded to, might be more thoughtful than the average Twitter users. Then, then there you go. That, that is it. It's, it's a roundtable viewer summed up in that very moment. More thoughtful content, more ability to listen, more enjoyment in discussing things. Thank you very much indeed. I have learned a great deal. Thank you. I hope you have, wherever you're watching this edition of Roundtable. From me, David Foster, until next time. Goodbye.